In many of the most popular games, the only goal is to kill. Is to kill. Groundbreaking Doom. And the Groundbreaking Doom. In these games, players experience spectacular levels of violence. As if they were looking straight through their own eyes and right down the barrel of a gun. Down the barrel of a gun. Doom. Even today, it stands as one of the most influential games of all time. From its platform-smashing first-person gameplay and impressive technology to the controversy surrounding its violence, Doom made a mark on the industry that remains to this day. It's also playable on just about any device you can imagine. From smartwatches to thermostats, Doom has become the violent equivalent of Hello World. But that wasn't always the case. In its day, Doom was cutting edge and the demand for ports to more affordable console hardware was sky high. On this episode of DF Retro then, we're focusing on Doom and its ports. From the original PC release to each of its official console ports, every version is on the table and it's all on real hardware. Some ports are great, others borderline unplayable, and we're going to examine all of them. So let's get started. It's difficult to overstate the impact of Doom when it made its shareware debut on the Software Creations BBS back in December 1993. Its fast-paced first-person gameplay, extreme violence, and rocking soundtrack took the gaming world by storm. This is pretty much more popular than football. Doom, along with Mortal Kombat and Night Trap, triggered the first wave of controversy surrounding video games and violence. It was one of the games that ultimately led to the rating systems we have in place today. But as visceral as the game is, there's so much more to its appeal than blood and demons. The basic design of Doom is incredibly elegant, and there are three key elements which I feel allow Doom to work so well. The first is the combat. Doom contains a limited number of enemies, and each enemy is unique in its behavior and sound, allowing players to immediately identify and react to threats. Designers can build a combination of threats in each combat area, requiring players to think on their feet. From hit-scanning shotgun troopers to fireball-throwing imps and melee-focused pinky demons, each enemy requires a specific strategy and rapid threat assessment. A combination of unique enemy types that are easy to understand with fast player movement and satisfying weapon animation results in an experience that is easy to learn but often challenging yet always appealing. Combat just feels perfect. The second key element lies in its level design. Modern shooters often focus on a linear path with an A to B to C style design, but Doom presents a series of non-linear puzzle boxes of sort that unfold before you. Take this early level for instance. Right away it presents a fork in the level design. One path leads to a locked door, the other to an unlocked one. Proceed through the unlocked door and you'll face a series of combat challenges, eventually leading to a key. Take this key, fight your way back to the fork, unlock the next door, and then proceed to the exit. Simple but later levels become far more complex, requiring lots of exploration, backtracking, and thought. The combat and level design work together to create something that satisfies a very specific portion of your brain. You're learning enemy patterns, solving simple navigational puzzles, and testing your reflexes. It's a delicate design that's not easy to emulate. The term Dune Clone was thrown around a lot back in the day, but very few games truly embraced the elegance of this design. The third element then, is what impressed me the most back in 1993, and what made Doom such a challenge to port elsewhere, its visuals. PCs of this era weren't exactly designed to support fast 3D graphics, or even fast 2D graphics for that matter, so when Doom appears with its super fast 3D visuals, many were left wondering, how the heck John Carmack pulled this off? Well, for one thing, Doom is not a true 3D game. Instead, its engine is designed to interpret 2D level data while using clever tricks to give the illusion of 3D. Before Doom, Wolfenstein 3D made use of ray casting, which uses the player's position and facing to determine what is drawn by sweeping left to right and drawing appropriately sized columns. Now, Doom is not a ray caster, instead relying on binary space partitioning. BSPs would become useful in many games going forward, and in Doom, allows the game to break up 2D map data into chunks or sectors, which are then stored in a BSP tree. 
By going through the tree, the game can test which walls are visible and draw them on screen front to back. This approach saves on precious processing time by basically pre-calculating everything. Wall textures then are stretched and displayed using an almost scanline-like approach, drawing in per pixel strips from one side of the screen to the other, while floors or the viz plane use more of a flood fill style approach. What this all means then is that Doom can present more complex levels than Wolfenstein. Walls could be placed at any angle, variable floor heights were possible, which included stairs, and even moving platforms could be added to levels. It's still limited due to its two-dimensional nature, of course, which is revealed by the fact that you can hit enemies at any elevation. Wall segments could move up and down now, which allowed for doors and platforms, but they could only do so vertically, not horizontally. Rooms cannot exist on top of one another, and slopes couldn't be drawn. All of this ultimately means that Doom could run fast, even on a mid-range 486. Taken together, Doom offers refined level design, clever combat, and cutting-edge visuals. It should come as no surprise then that there was a huge desire to see Doom brought to consoles, but a game like Doom, which relies heavily on CPU grunt, wasn't exactly a great fit. In that sense, Doom illustrates the huge difference between console and PC technology at the time. If you look at console hardware during this era, these machines were built to quickly display tiles and sprites. The hardware was designed to perform these operations at 60 Hz, often with dedicated background layers which enabled beautiful parallax scrolling. So while the CPUs were very slow and limited by PC standards, the design of the hardware enabled fast moving action games like this. Now this was less true on the PC, where the video hardware was not really designed to handle scrolling playfields at high speeds. It's true that id Software got its start working on games like Commander Keen, but they really didn't scroll or move anywhere near as smoothly as actual console games. Now, clever programming tricks overcame some of these limitations eventually, but even the best efforts like Jazz Jackrabbit, for instance, still fall far behind the best console games of this era in terms of background and stage complexity. Ultimately, consoles were more capable than the PC when displaying 2D action games at 60 frames per second, but the stronger CPUs on the PC could enable pseudo-3D games like Doom to exist. Which is why bringing Doom over to consoles was not an easy task. The market leaders, the Super NES and Sega Genesis, could never handle Doom without additional hardware, for instance. Thankfully, 1993 marked the introduction of next-generation machines such as the Atari Jaguar and the 3DO, along with the promise of machines from other manufacturers in the future. As such, the era of Doom ports began, and slowly but surely, each moderately capable machine would receive its own incarnation of the game. Rather than tackling each console version chronologically then, I've decided to approach this by starting with the least playable port all the way up through the most playable. Sure, that sounds like worst of best, and in some ways it is, but there are certain nearly unplayable ports which might still be impressive for the hardware. Got it? Let's get started. There's no getting around it, Doom for the 3DO is terrible. Sluggish performance and awful controls make for a borderline unplayable version of the game. So what happened? We don't know for sure what was going on back then, but we have a pretty good idea thanks to the account of Doom 3DO coder Rebecca Heinemann. According to Becky, the port was produced on a ridiculously short schedule due to mismanagement by the CEO of Art Data Interactive, Randy Scott. He acquired the rights to Doom and kicked the hype train into full gear. According to Heinemann's account, this is a guy that believed you could just draw new weapons and insert them right into the game. Easy as that. Needless to say, he didn't really get it. But the 3DO company itself caught wind of the hype and checked up on this port that was supposedly in production, only to find that nothing was really done. Which is where Rebecca Heinemann comes in. Heinemann is a top tier programmer that worked on a huge number of games over the years, and just prior to accepting the Doom project, she had completed work on Wolfenstein 3D for the 3DO, which is an excellent port. So, Doom is set to ship in time for Christmas, and the 3DO company is begging for help. Heinemann accepts under the impression that much of the game was already done, but in reality, nothing was done, 
She spent 10 weeks porting the Atari Jaguar version of Doom to the 3DO. And the results are as you'd expect with such a difficult schedule. Randy didn't even bother checking out the submitted code in the end and wound up printing a quarter of a million copies, the same number of 3DO consoles in the wild. Needless to say, when it only sold 10,000 copies, the mistake became obvious and Art Data Interactive was no more. While 3DO Doom may have been a Jaguar port, a lot of changes were made to support the 3DO system. New code was written to take advantage of the 3DO cell engine, for instance, which allows for 2D objects to be rotated and scaled freely. The artwork was converted into proper palettes and 3DO cells, a new user interface was made, and modifications to the controller input were implemented. The initial port, completed after just five weeks, was run entirely in software at roughly three frames per second. And while some ARM assembly work did improve things further, it wasn't until the cell engine was brought into the mix that things started to improve further. But what about the floors and ceilings? Well, the 3D hardware on 3DO does not support perspective correct texturing, and using it resulted in severe warping issues that forced her to instead draw the floor and ceiling textures in software using the slow 12.5 MHz CPU. In addition, all textures in the game were resized as 64 by 64 pixels rather than variable sizes like in the original game, allowing Heinemann to save memory by packing textures into the resource file without coordinate data included. This means calling and displaying textures was simplified as the art size was consistent across the board. Of course, as with the Jaguar version, 3DO Doom features fewer overall textures, which helps with memory constraints but leaves us with a very brown looking version of Doom. She also implemented movement acceleration for the D-pad based on how long you hold the D-pad in in combination with the current movement speed. The 3DO version also features six screen sizes, though two are locked down as a cheat. As with the PC original, a full screen view required more CPU grunt than a smaller window and on 3DO, it works much the same way. The game was advertised as having four speeds, which really refers to the four window sizes. At the default size, the game runs very slowly, but shrink it down to the minimum and it becomes somewhat more playable. This version includes a cheat to unlock two larger window sizes, however, including one that is nearly full screen, which is where the screenshots on the back of the package were taken from, by the way. The full screen mode is basically unplayable, with a frame rate that feels like a low end 386 at best. As you can see from this frame rate analysis, the performance is simply abysmal with numbers that hang below 10 frames per second most of the time. So why include this at all then? Well, 3DO is promising the arrival of the next generation M2 at some point in the future, and this new machine would supposedly run original 3DO games at a higher speed. If you were using an M2 then, this cheat would allow for a larger view and increased performance of course. Now we know that the M2 console would never be released, though the hardware was used in a smattering of arcade games. Fortunately, we can simulate this. Using the emulator 3DO Play, Doom runs similarly to real hardware. It's a choppy mess, however, it's also possible to raise the CPU clock from its 12.5 MHz default up to 30 MHz. This is basically virtually overclocking the software CPU and it works. The virtual CPU crunches through Doom at a much higher frame rate, resulting in a smoother overall experience. Then there's the sound. Heinemann noted that she wasn't able to get the sound driver working in time for ship, which would have meant no music just like the Jaguar version. Despite his lack of business acumen then, it turns out that Randy Scott, Art Data CEO, was a guitarist and had a band. So Becky sent off a cassette tape recorded using the PC soundtrack and Scott and his band actually produced new versions of these songs which were then implemented back into the game as digital music. The music is one of the most interesting aspects of this port in the end if you can believe it. Okay, so at this point it's clear that the frame rate is an issue, but for me the real problem lies with its input latency. Despite the interesting tweaks to movement acceleration, the fact remains that Doom is highly unresponsive. Press a button and it feels like an eternity before the weapon fires. Now, you might think that this is due to the low frame rate, but there are other versions which run nearly as poorly yet still manage to offer responsive controls. When combined with the low frame rate, it makes for a game that is nearly impossible to control. Altogether though, despite the lack of quality, Doom for 3DO is a fascinating port with an interesting history behind it. 
That it was made in 10 weeks primarily by a single person is incredibly impressive, but unfortunately Randy's poor business decisions ultimately resulted in a game that was much worse than it could have been. Perhaps with more time, Becky could have turned this into one of the best versions of Doom instead of the worst. Of course, going forward, Becky used the knowledge gained from working on this project and implemented ideas into the engine designed for the 3DO game Killing Time. Interesting how these things work out. Welcome to the port that defied all expectations, Doom for the Super NES. From the outside, this felt like an impossible task at the time, but Randy Linden and his team thought otherwise. Randy Linden is a talented coder that would go on to create the Bleem PlayStation emulator years later, but in the mid-90s, Linden saw an opportunity on Nintendo's outgoing machine. If you haven't figured it out already, Doom was a huge deal at this time, and if he could get it up and running on the Super NES, surely success would follow. But the system's slow CPU was no match for Doom, and thus Randy turned to the Super FX GSU-2. Clocked at 21.4 MHz, the Super FX-2 chip was an improved design on Argonaut's original chip used to create Star Fox. This custom-made RISC processor assisted the system by performing operations such as drawing the polygons in Star Fox, using more advanced math than the system was otherwise capable of, which could then be passed to the main system. Of course, even with this chip, the Doom engine itself was likely beyond what the system could handle, especially regarding memory requirements, so Randy came up with something else. His own engine, referred to as the Reality Engine. The game is rendered at the typical resolution of the Super NES, which is 256 by 224 but is displayed in a much smaller window. In addition, horizontal pixels are doubled, resulting in a much chunkier looking game. This is the equivalent to the low detail mode on PC. By doubling each pixel in one direction, the rendering load is reduced. While there isn't a lot known on the reality engine itself, based on what we know about the original Doom engine, it likely draws walls and floors using different techniques. Perhaps due to speed or memory limitations, only the walls are drawn in this version. In addition, enemy sprites are only stored with the front-facing artwork, meaning that you can no longer sneak up on them. Particles, smoke, and other effects are also absent from this version, something which impacts the way the weapons work. The shotgun spread, for instance, is gone, meaning that it acts more like a sniper rifle of sorts. Sound propagation is disabled as well, rendering enemies effectively deaf, though without rear-facing sprites it wouldn't be that useful anyway. On the other hand, music is handled by the SPC-700, and it sounds reasonably okay. Not amazing due to some of the instrument choices of course, but well, listen to this comparison, what do you think? There is one impressive aspect of this port, however, the maps themselves. The layout and design of the maps more closely mirrors the PC original. In areas where, say, the stairs were removed in other versions, they are present on the Super NES, just like the PC. Most ports were derived from the work done on the Atari Jaguar version, which we'll talk about soon, but that's not the case here, and it shows. Unfortunately, no matter how impressive it looks for the system, the frame rate is very low, though admittedly still a lot higher than the original Star Fox. As you can see, it hangs closely to the 10 frames per second mark. It's slightly faster overall than the 3DO version, I'd say, but really not by much. What this frame rate analysis reveals about the engine, though, is a little more interesting. Notice the frame time spikes in the graph here. That's not a glitch. The tool calculates results based on the appearance of duplicate frames, but each of the frames that we see here are actually unique. Why is that? Well, the Super NES features multiple background layers, which are typically used for scrolling playfields. In this case, however, the HUD and weapon graphics appear to operate on a different layer than the 3D game graphics. 
it's likely that the data from the SuperFX chip is blasted into one of these layers, while the other graphics operate on independent layers. Control-wise, well, the game is serviceable in that it's more responsive than the 3DO version, but it lacks the option to circle strafe due to the way the engine works, and you often find yourself getting caught on walls, which doesn't really feel very good. So why is this version of Doom the 8th least playable then? Well, ultimately, the frame rate is comparable to 3DO, but ever so slightly more consistent, while the controls are generally slightly more responsive. Beyond that, I think it's worth considering the feat itself. Doom on the Super NES is an incredible achievement for the time, despite its flaws. It's not a version you'd want to play today, mind you, but it is absolutely one with an important history. Doom for Sega Saturn is a slow game, very slow. This now infamous port released after the PlayStation version is one of the last official ports to be released, and it's not good. But it didn't have to be that way. Saturn Doom was ported by Rage Software, and the main programmer on this project was Jim Bagley. If you were into the ZX Spectrum back in the day, you might be familiar with Jim's work, but he's programmed games for many other platforms as well, and currently, He's working on the ZX Spectrum Next, which is looking pretty great. So with all that experience under his belt then, what went wrong? Well the original pitch was to port the PC version of Doom to the Saturn with the entirety of Doom 1 and Doom 2 included in the package, but ultimately he had to settle on porting the PlayStation version. Why is that? Well that's where things get interesting. Originally, Begley wanted to build Doom with the Saturn hardware in mind. That means taking advantage of both video display processors and the dual Hitachi SH2s. Jim wrote a hardware accelerated version of the engine, in which walls were handled by VDP-1. This version was reportedly running at 60 frames per second according to Jim, but ultimately it was vetoed from on high. You see, everything still hinged on approval from id Software. Jim's high speed version of Doom had one major caveat, texture warping. Carmack is understandably not a fan of affine texture warping and shot down this version of the game, asking Jim to rewrite it to more closely match the original PC version. He even suggested using the system's two DSPs to render the screen, which only have four kilobytes of memory. This decision ultimately handicapped the port, though Carmack later admitted in a tweet that perhaps he should have allowed for more experimentation, and I think the end results support this. After changing gears then, the dev team was in a rough spot. Without assistance from VDP-1, Saturn is basically an overclocked Sega 32X, so it should come as no surprise that the end results were rather slow. The workload then is divided up between two SH2s. One SH2 handles the walls, while the other handles the Viz plane. The PS1 maps then were selected for this version as they were already prepared for a low memory environment. As expected then, Saturn Doom shares a lot with the PlayStation version. It uses the same WAD format, Maps are stored the same way in both versions, and much of the on-disk data is identical, including graphics only used in the PlayStation version. Like PS1 Doom then, the Saturn version includes a selection of maps from Doom and Doom 2. Most of the original Doom maps are derived from the Jaguar version, but Ultimate Doom and Doom 2 maps were only modified very slightly compared to the original PC maps, making them more demanding. While Saturn is based on the PS1 version, the end results are ultimately very different. For one thing, the colored sector data, which lends the PS1 version some semblance of colored lighting, is still present on the Saturn disc in terms of its data, but it's not used in the game at all. The Saturn version is dim and monochromatic compared to the PS1 version. There's also a bug with the audio. The sound effects are panned left when using the stereo mode, forcing you to use mono instead if you want to hear sound effects in both speakers. The PS1 version also introduces actual transparency effects, but on Saturn this is once again replaced with the mesh transparency instead, as you can see here. It is at least interesting that VDP2, which handles 2D tile-based planes primarily, is used for the HUD and sky layer, so it often updates separately from the main 3D portion of the image. But hey, at least the game is full screen, avoids any texture warping issues, and feels surprisingly good to control.
It also features Aubrey Hodge's music, though on Saturn it's stored as Redbook audio on the disc. <laughs> The main issue here, though, is performance. Saturn Doom runs at an obscenely slow frame rate. It's slightly faster than 3DO and SNES Doom, mind you, but only just. The original Doom levels are the most playable in this port thanks to the simplified Jaguar layouts, but as you move into the ultimate Doom maps, or the Doom 2 maps for that matter, things grind to a halt rather quickly. And this is ultimately the real issue with this port. It looks nice enough, but when the performance is this slow, it becomes very difficult to enjoy. At least the controls feel nice despite this. The firing rate of the weapons, for instance, appears to be increased in this version to compensate for the low frame rate, and input is surprisingly responsive, especially compared to the 3DO version. Lastly, I finally tested the rumor which suggested that the Japanese version of Saturn Doom runs faster than the American release, and the results? Well, they're virtually identical. Using this demonstration level, which plays from the title screen, you can see that the results here are like for like. Both versions turn in an average frame rate of just 13 frames per second for this segment. Now keep in mind that if you were playing the PAL release back in the day, you would see lower frame rates, but the rumor has typically focused on the NTSC U versus NTSC J versions, and well, at least we can finally put that rumor to bed. But ultimately, this is still one of the least playable ports out there. It comes in at number 7 on the playability list due to its more responsive controls and slightly higher frame rate compared to 3DO and Super NES, but it's fair to say that this version remains the most disappointing of all. To understand the impact, look no further than Digital Foundry's own Rich Ledbetter's review of Doom for the Sega Saturn magazine back in the day. After years of waiting, Doom finally arrives on the Saturn, he writes. Unfortunately, it's a breathtakingly bad conversion of a classic game. Saturn owners have every reason to be outraged by this game. So here's a surprise. Less than 10 years after the arrival of Doom, it was ported to a handheld system. The Game Boy Advance version of Doom was ported by David A. Palmer Productions and is directly based on the Atari Jaguar version, but with a few changes. Now before we dig into this, I should note that all the footage you're seeing here was captured using a Game Boy Player connected to a GameCube. But instead of using the awful Game Boy Player disc supplied by Nintendo, I've opted instead for homebrew software called Game Boy Interface, which produces much better results. This is captured from the ultra-low latency version using an RGB cable with a PAL GameCube. Okay, so firstly, Doom GBA runs at a lower resolution, designed to match the output of the Game Boy Advance's screen. It also uses the double pixel width or low detail mode to improve rendering speed, resulting in rather chunky looking graphics. Keep in mind though that this was designed for a very small screen, and as such, this limitation would have been a lot less noticeable on real hardware. This version also ditches the depth shading present in other versions, where surfaces near the player would be drawn with a higher light level than those at a distance. This lends the game a very monochromatic look of sorts, which isn't especially attractive due to the lack of contrast. In addition, sprites are always displayed at full brightness, and stand out against the backgrounds as a result. There's even an option to enable static lighting in the options menu, which slightly improves performance. It's entirely possible that these changes were implemented to better suit the Game Boy Advance screen, which was not backlit in the original models. The original lighting levels may have rendered the game unplayable on a standard system. That said, it's equally likely that eliminating these features improved rendering speed as well. Oh, and like SNES Doom, sound propagation is disabled, but this time it has an impact since all sides of sprites can be drawn. Fire a weapon in an adjacent area and enemies will not react, unlike other versions of the game. So what about the music then? Well, take a listen. What do you guys think? 
There are a lot of subtle changes across the board in this version, but ultimately it's still mighty impressive for a handheld console from this era. What pushes this version to the sixth most playable, however, is its frame rate. GBA Doom runs smoother than all previous versions we've looked at thus far, and as a result, it feels better to play. That's not to say things are perfect here, the performance is a little strange. For one thing, it features screen tearing, which is unexpected, and secondly, game speed is tied to the frame rate, which can lead to some wild swings in consistency. But still, taken for what it is, this is a mighty impressive effort indeed. Oh, and how could I forget, the GBA version has green blood. It's just Mortal Kombat and the Super NES all over again. Doom 2 was also released in the GBA, but this time it uses Taurus Games' own engine as they develop this port, rather than anything related to Doom itself. Doom 2 is a more complex game, so it was necessary to adapt to the hardware. The results aren't bad per se, but again, lighting is all but removed, leading to a flat pixelated version of the game. Distant objects also pixelate to a rather severe degree. It doesn't look great, but still, it's Doom 2 in your pocket. Ultimately though, both versions are interesting for the time and work surprisingly well on the GBA. For the historical value alone, it's worth checking out these versions of Doom. Ah uh, yes, the 32X. After running through every single game on the system during the last two episodes, Doom for 32X stands out as one of the better conversions for the system. This is the very first console version of Doom to be released, though technically the second to be developed. And as with so many others, the 32X iteration is derived from the Atari Jaguar version, but with more limitations. For one thing, there's just 17 levels in the game, all of which are modified to match the Jag version. This means that the entirety of the third episode is absent here, and when you beat the game using cheats, you get nothing but a DOS prompt. This version, like the Super NES port, only features front-facing sprites due to memory limitations. The 32X iteration is somewhat ugly compared to these other ports though, due to a limited color palette and grainy visuals. It even plays in a rather small window. Then there's the music, which was poorly converted from the original PC MIDI files, and sounds like this. Honestly, the music is so bad that even something like MIDI Disaster's version of the same track played on a dot matrix printer sounds more appealing. But this is one case where I'd argue that the sound chip is not at fault, however. Take this remix from Evil Telephone, for instance. It makes far better use of FM synthesis than what was shipped on the 32X. Much better, right? Of course, there's plenty of other remixes out there if you look, but this is just one example of the missed potential with this version. Okay, so thus far I've been pretty harsh on this version of the game, so why did it score so highly on the playability scale then? Well, it's pretty simple. Doom on the 32X runs smoothly. That's really all it comes down to. It's limited, ugly, and lacking features, but it runs at a much better frame rate than the other versions we've tested at this point, thus is far more playable. It controls well, runs consistently, and most importantly, is Doom. But here's the thing, there was more to this port at one point. John Carmack himself helped work on the 32X version, which might explain its smooth performance, and thanks to leaked prototypes, we have a better idea of how things changed. This build here is from September 94, just a few months before ship, and it's rather impressive. It features a larger viewport than the shipping game, which results in a lower frame rate no doubt, but more importantly, it more closely resembles the PC original. That's right, the level complexity and texture detail is much higher than the shipping game and by extension, the Jaguar version. Take this section. In the final build, it's flattened out and simplified here with the slime raised up all around the player. It's the same in all the other ports aside from the Super NES version. In the 32X prototype, however, it's just like the PC version, and much more detailed, though clearly it doesn't run very well here. 
we see a lot of the PC textures included as well. This blue texture early on, it was used a lot in the PC version and it's missing from most of the console ports, but it's here in this prototype. Same with these pillars in this first room. The stairs in the second stage though are absent, but the middle section is still raised, which is interesting. Clearly, even this close to ship then, the 32X version was rather ambitious and was likely cut down dramatically in order to ship on time and get the performance up. With another six months, who knows what could have been, but hey, by that point, the 32X would already be on the way out. Amazingly, even with these enhanced levels, the game still manages to run better than the other previous versions, save for the GBA version. Ultimately though, the final shipping game is a good version of Doom. It's missing features and is relatively ugly, but it runs smoothly and is fun to play, hence why it comes in at number 5. The next port though, is perhaps the most pivotal console conversion of the game, the port which spawned so many others. And I say to you, my brothers and sisters, hell is a deep, dark, foul-smelling prison of the damned. Hell, hell with fire and brimstone. Lost. At last it's time for the Atari Jaguar version. This legendary port was the very first console conversion completed, and it was handled entirely in-house by John Carmack himself. It's an excellent port of the game, and in my opinion, the second best console port of Doom from this era. It takes full advantage of the hardware to deliver a full screen Doom experience on a console in 1994 at a time when an IBM PC was still extremely expensive. Alright, so let's start with the basics then. As mentioned, Jag Doom is full screen, but like several other ports, makes use of the low detail mode which doubles horizontal pixels, cutting the effective horizontal resolution in half. While this is certainly a compromise, it still manages to look reasonably sharp on a CRT TV. But where the Jaguar port really excels is in its use of color, and it's here that it absolutely decimates the PC original. Jag Doom uses the system's CRY color format as opposed to RGB or another option. When using this color format, you have 8 bits for color and 8 bits for luminance. RGB will offer a greater number of colors overall for sure with smoother blending, but CRY can offer smoother shading. The idea was that Jaguar games would focus on smooth shaded polygon surfaces rather than textured polygons, and the CRY color format allows for this. But it has its limitations. The format is designed around shading towards black. Out of 255 values, 255 will represent the peak value of a color like say blue, while zero represents black. In between then, you have different shades of that color until it reaches black. This is why color blending isn't especially smooth in a CRY color system. In the case of Doom, however, this is a perfect fit. Doom is a very dark game, and shading to black is precisely what the art calls for, thus it works brilliantly here. Where can you see it most prominently? In the depth shading. The gradient as objects move into the distance is completely smooth on Jaguar. No obvious color banding. Other versions of the game exhibit obvious banding instead. The PC original only supports 256 colors period, and is especially bad for this. So while the resolution is lower, the shading is so much smoother on the JEG compared to other versions that it really sticks out. Unfortunately, due to cartridge size limitations, this is where the cut down versions of the maps were born. Maps were modified from the PC originals to better fit the system, but these maps would be passed forward in subsequent ports, even when it wasn't necessary. The other issue here is the lack of music. Music playback on the JEG is handled by the system's DSP, but in the case of Doom, this is reserved for other needs, such as collision detection. As such, the resources necessary for music playback simply aren't available. Music is only heard in this version between missions. Now, if this had been available for the Jaguar CD, they could have used Redbook Audio instead, which would have been awesome. One thing you can do while playing the game though is simply pipe music through the same set of speakers you're using to play Jag Doom. When you combine the sound effects from the Jag with music of your choice, it sounds pretty good. Okay, so how about performance then? Compared to every other port we've examined thus far, the Jaguar version reigns supreme. On the JEG, the frame rate is capped at 20 frames per second, 
and the game manages to deliver that relatively often. There's still plenty of dips below that line of course, but the lowest performance on the JAG is equivalent to the fastest performance on Saturn and 3DO Doom. Now granted, 20 FPS isn't exactly a high frame rate, but compared to the competition, it was pretty impressive. This is 1994 after all, and competing games couldn't even come close. The well-regarded Alien vs Predator on the JAG for instance runs at a much lower frame rate than Doom, while featuring more simplistic level design. When taking into consideration the landscape then, it's clear that the JAG version is excellent. As mentioned earlier, PCs were still expensive, much more so than today. So the Jaguar offered players a chance to experience Doom at a comparable level of quality at a much lower price. But it gets more interesting. The Jaguar scene is very active today if you didn't know, and we'll be exploring that in an upcoming video I'm planning on the system itself, but for now I want to discuss this. Doom 2 for the Jag. Okay, so this isn't actually Doom 2, rather a ROM hack of the original Doom. It's limited to the same weapons and assets throughout the original of course and lacks any of the death shading, but it works. Unfortunately, without a skunk board and with the upcoming SD ROM card still in development, I was only able to test this out via emulation. The game speed isn't quite right here and the controls are extremely laggy making it very difficult to play, but this is still cool. I can't wait to try it on real Jaguar hardware in the future. Now I haven't really discussed multiplayer yet and I can't show it here. But if you connect two Jaguars together, you can actually play this game in multiplayer. Unfortunately, in my experience in the past, this often results in disconnects. But still, it's a very forward-looking feature. And by the way, the Super NES version, that also had support for the X-Band modem, so you could play that one in multiplayer as well. And even the European and Japanese versions of Doom for the Saturn also had multiplayer. Ultimately, the main takeaway from the Jag version is simple. In 94, this was a fantastic way to play Doom and one of the best reasons to own a Jaguar. It runs at full screen at 20 frames per second on average with an interesting implementation of color shading. It's also the only fully official id software programmed port of Doom. Yes, Carmack contributed to the 32X version as well, but this one was all id. But just two years later, the Jaguar met its match with what I feel to be the very best console port of Doom from the 90s. Doom for the PlayStation is a perfect example of how to convert a game. It's packed with content, featuring most of the levels from Doom, including Ultimate Doom, and Doom 2, and some new ones, for a total of 59 maps. While this version still shares aspects with the Jaguar conversion, including the simplified Doom 1 maps, the rest of the port feels incredibly fresh and new. They even managed to cram every single enemy into the game, aside from the Arch Vial, which is impressive enough. Okay, so let's start with the basics for this one then. This version of Doom does not use the low detail mode and is presented at full resolution. It's much cleaner and sharper than any other console port from this era. The renderer was also upgraded to support a high color mode. This allows for colored sectors, where individual sectors could now have a defined color value, essentially faking colored lighting. This allows for some very moody scenes indeed. This version also includes true alpha transparency for many surfaces and effects, which looks great. And another nice feature is the introduction of animated skies, something lacking from all other official versions of Doom. Beyond that, Doom for the PlayStation is also drawn using techniques that differ from the original game. The system draws walls using a series of small rectangles rather than in a per pixel strip, but this can result in distortion at steep angles. Still, texture warping is kept to a minimum here compared to many other PlayStation games, so it manages to work out in the end. All told, the visuals on display in PlayStation Doom are excellent and remain unique to this version. This is clearly the best looking port of its era. Then there's the audio. Aubrey Hodges was brought on board to score this version of Doom and the results are incredible. Yes, the rocking soundtrack of the original is still great in its own right, of course, but this lends the game an entirely different atmosphere, and it works. The music is dark and foreboding, and unlike the Saturn version, which uses similar tracks but plays them back as Red Book audio, 
the PlayStation version uses its audio chip to play back these tracks instead. Each piece is stored as a .lcd file, with just a few samples per track stored within. These are then played back by the system's sound chip, and the results are excellent. Some users even dug up an easter egg of sorts in one track. You might already be familiar with this, but check it out. Listen to this one. Cool, right? Okay, that's the normal version, but if you speed it up, you can hear this instead. I'd love to know the story behind this one. Now, in addition to the music, all of the sound effects were remade as well and sound pretty nice. I still have a soft spot for the original sound effects, but it's nice to have something new with this version. PlayStation Doom also supports the PlayStation Link Cable for co-op and deathmatch. Unlike the JEG Link version, this one is actually reliable. I played through a huge chunk of the game with a friend of mine using the PlayStation Link Cable and it was a blast. This is the PAL version here by the way as I don't have multiple NTSC copies handy but as you can see it works rather well, albeit the frame rate's a little lower. The controls are also excellent here with the ability to circle strafe and move freely through the world. This is before dual analog was an option on the PlayStation, but even still, it feels very nice to play. Then there's performance. It's not perfect, but compared to every previous version including the Jaguar version, PS1 Doom runs faster and smoother. The frame rate cap is now bumped up to 30 frames per second from 20 but the average frame rate does still drop below this line, so it's not completely stable. The overall experience is smooth enough though, and it feels great compared to the other conversions. That said, the game is at its smoothest when playing Doom 1 maps, as they are somewhat simplified. The Doom 2 levels are much closer to their PC counterparts, and as such can definitely exhibit some pretty serious drops, but even these drops are still higher than what you get in other ports from this era, so it's not too bad. And ultimately, that's why this version rates so highly on the playability scale. It's the smoothest console port from this era, and is a joy to play. Beyond that, it looks and sounds unlike any other version, and features loads of content. This version is so good, that even if you had access to the PC version back in the day, it was still worth experiencing Doom on a PlayStation. It really is that good. But with the next two ports, we move into the next millennium, and come closer than ever to matching the original experience. It took more than 10 years, but we finally have a near perfect port of the original PC game and it came from an unexpected place. Late in the life of the original Xbox, Vicarious Visions released a port of Doom 3 from Microsoft's console. It was an incredible port at the time, boasting cutting edge 3D graphics for the platform. Doom 3 seemed to exceed what the system could do, and it was absolutely fantastic. If you purchased the special edition of the game, or later, Resurrection of Evil, one of the big extras included was a complete port of Doom 1 and 2. And unlike every other version we've seen thus far, this is a straight PC port. All the maps, enemies, and weapons are included in this version, and in addition, two brand new maps. It even includes multiplayer and split screen options. It also runs full screen at a perfect frame rate, albeit with some judder. The main issue here is that Doom was designed to operate at 70 Hz on a CRT monitor with a frame rate of 35 FPS or half the refresh. On a 60Hz display, however, this 35fps cap remains and introduces slight judder. Even still, it's smoother than any other console version before it and feels amazing to play, something further enhanced by the addition of dual analog control. But it's not perfect, 
for one thing, the skyboxes in later levels of Doom 1 are all missing, replaced instead with the skybox from the first episode. In addition, the resolution of the game is a little strange. It's rendered at 320x240, but the Xbox only supports a minimum resolution of 480i. So this version runs in either 480i or 480p, resulting in an image that isn't quite as crisp as the original PlayStation version. There's also no gamma control here, and the game can appear rather dark depending on your setup. The sound is also locked to a very low sample rate and isn't quite on par with the original. The music isn't bad though, but again, it could have been further enhanced. Still, given its release date, this was an excellent bonus feature and a fantastic way to play Doom on a more modern machine. Now, I've been pairing my PC with a TV since 2003, but it was still uncommon during this era, and small living room PCs weren't really much of a thing either. As such, its existence at the time was great, and it would remain supreme in the console space until the next generation. But before we get to the best available console version of Doom, we have to talk about this. Doom 64. This iteration of Doom does not fit in with the rest of the games on the list, simply because it's a brand new game. But it's so good that I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. Doom 64 was developed by Aaron Sealer Productions, and Aaron himself worked alongside John Carmack in building the hardware renderer used for the game. That's right, Doom 64 is the first 3D accelerated conversion of Doom. It takes full advantage of the N64 hardware, enabling effects and techniques never before seen in the Doom engine. Because at its core, it still very much was based on the original Doom engine, just heavily modified and improved. For one thing, it runs at 320x240 and unlike other versions, operates at a rock-solid, locked 30 frames per second. This is the most fluid console conversion of Doom ever released. It supports bilinear texture filtering, features all new artwork, and introduces effects such as fog, moving skies, advanced lighting, and a higher overall color depth. It also features a brand new selection of maps crafted specifically for this version. These are tough, well-made maps that channel everything that makes Doom great. Doom 64 is an interesting game then. It's basically a full-on hardware accelerated sequel to Doom 2. And looking back at the entirety of the N64 library, I truly believe that Doom 64 is absolutely one of the very best games on the platform. It takes brilliant advantage of the hardware, runs like a dream, and offers some incredible Doom gameplay, all with a moody Aubrey Hodges soundtrack. If you've never played Doom 64, I cannot recommend it enough. Now, on to the last, best, and most playable conversion of the original games. Here it is, at last, the most playable port of Doom on consoles. The idea behind this one is simple, bring the PC experience to a console without compromise. Yes, the frame rate is still capped at 35 frames per second like the original game, but it's full screen, runs at a higher resolution, and features the entirety of Ultimate Doom and Doom 2. Networking options are available and the control is highly refined, taking full advantage of modern controllers. It feels absolutely spot on and is a blast to play. So why group PlayStation 3 and 360 together? While there are certainly minor differences here, these two ports at their core are basically the same, and both are excellent. It started with the original Doom released on Xbox Live Arcade in 2006 for the 360. This disappeared in 2010 after Activision lost the rights, but reappeared in 2012 thanks to Bethesda along with Doom 2. The PS3 first received its port alongside Doom 3 BFG Edition, which included the Ultimate Doom and Doom 2. Same goes for the 360 version, of course. Later on, Doom Classic Complete was released with the master levels for Doom 2 and Final Doom included, making it the most complete version of Doom on consoles. But ultimately, this version of Doom is really all about that, the original experience. There's no texture filtering here. The soundtrack is based on the original PC version, and no additional effects are present. Only the resolution is increased. 
That said, there is one drawback. They did replace the cross on the health kits with this pill icon, but hey, what are you gonna do? Ultimately though, this version truly is the best of the console releases. It runs without a hitch, offers the best visuals, the most responsive controls, the most multiplayer options, and the most content. Now, on the flip side, it's also somewhat less interesting to discuss than the older ports, simply because no compromises need to be made here at all, but still, it's the best way to play Doom on consoles. But this is really just one tiny subset of Doom discussion, those console ports. Even a solid hour of DF Retro isn't enough to handle all aspects of Doom. There's the other official versions, for instance, a port for the Tapwave Zodiac, and even a pocket PC version exists. It even released on the iPhone by John Carmack himself, and if I had the time, I would have covered these as well, but hey. And that's not even touching on the crazy world of source ports, which could warrant an entire second episode on Doom. Perhaps someday. And with that, we've come to the end of another episode of DF Retro. Looking back, it's clear that getting Doom up and running on consoles back in the day was no small feat, but the results are fascinating all the same. Of the bunch, I have a soft spot for the PlayStation version with its colored sectors and moody soundtrack, but the Atari Jaguar version sticks out as well for its relatively smooth performance and impressive usage of the CRY color space. Which is your favorite port? Be sure to let us know in the comments below. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and follow me over on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.